you will remember last week, we read the story of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea into their freedom, into their liberation. God um, opening up the Red Sea and providing them dry ground across as the Egyptians chased after them, and then bringing the waters down so that the Israelites were indeed free. Well, what was it that the Israelites did at the very first moment of their freedom? They praised God. They recounted the story that had just happened. They recounted the, the story of their crossing, and they praised. In Exodus 15, there are two accounts of their song. The first one is one of Moses and the Israelites, and it's a long poem, a long song that recounts the very details of the story of their freedom. But after that, there is a short little song known as the Song of Miriam. As you'll hear, Miriam was Aaron's sister, possibly Moses' sister, but very clearly the text states that, that she's Aaron's sister, and she's also a prophet. And what she does is that she goes out with the women, and she starts to, to she bring, they bring their tambourines, and they play, and they dance, and, they, and then she starts to sing a song that's praising the story that just happened and the miracle that God provided for them. And so I think that's powerful as we hear this story coming up about that Tara is going to share. And the story that Tara shares is one that is a recounting of a very particular and hard moment in her and her family's life, but also a praise of the miracle that God provided in their family. And it shows us that God is still alive, God is still at work, God is still active, God is still providing miracles for us, God's creation, God's children. And so I invite you to hear this song of Miriam and hear this song of Tara. And I invite you to reflect upon your own life. Examine your own life and see the work of God in your own life. So let us turn now to the Song of Miriam, and then on the other side of the scripture reading, you'll hear Tara's song, Tara's testimony. So hear now the words from Exodus 15, verses 19 through 21. When the horses of Pharaoh, with his chariots and his chariot drivers, went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi, my name is Tara Gamble, and I'm here to tell my testimony about the accident that ended the life of my ex-husband and almost killed my nine-year-old son. It was a regular Sunday afternoon. We had just eaten dinner. I was cleaning up. We were waiting for my son to come home. He'd gone up to Canada for the weekend with his dad to see his brand new two-month-old baby sister. Um, and then I saw the police outside and didn't really think much of it. Thought maybe something happened with a neighbor and then they knocked on my door. And I answered and they verified who I was and then proceeded to tell me something that I never would have imagined in a million years. He told me my son was in a car accident in upstate New York and that he was airlifted to a hospital in Syracuse, New York. I started shaking. I started crying. And then I asked, well, what about Terrence? And they said, he's dead. I started hyperventilating. I started asking, where was my son? I need to get to my son. I need to get to him right away. And the police officers just kept saying, you need to have someone drive you. You can't drive in the state that you're in. 
I, my parents came to watch my daughter, and my partner drove me up. We got to the hospital four hours later, and we went into the PICU, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. The social worker had warned me. She said, you're going to need someone to hold you when you walk in there. And I thought, I just need to see my son and tell him that everything's okay and give him a hug and, and, then, and then, you know, we'll go from there. <laughs> well, uh, I got in that room and I saw my son with tons of tubes hanging out of him, a bunch of machines all around him, metal rods sticking out of his legs, a machine stuck to his mouth, assisting him with breathing, something sticking out of his head. I got dizzy. I got sick. I felt weak. My partner held me. I walked closer. I saw his face. His face was like an angel. Untouched. Not a scratch. Not a bruise. Nothing. His face was perfect. And he looked peaceful. And I knew in that moment that God was there, that God was going to help my son stay alive. The next seven days were awful. The doctors explained that he had a traumatic brain injury among other, his 16 other serious injuries. Um, and a Glasgow coma scale of three. A three is the worst. It goes from three to 15. A three basically means that you're brain dead. And just to help you understand a little better, when somebody has a three, the statistics are, there's an 89% chance that they will die. 7% chance that they will be in a vegetative state for their entire lives and a 4% chance of satisfactory recovery. So I just kept praying <laughs> that my son would come alive again, <laughs> be able to breathe and open his eyes smile, eat, do things that he did before to a certain extent. I was just grateful that he was alive and was praying that he would stay alive. The doctors kept telling me all of the awful things that could happen. <laughs> you know, he's going to be in the hospital for at least three months. Then he's going to go to a long-term rehab. He may have to live at the rehab forever. He may never be able to use the bathroom on his own. He most likely won't be able to walk again. His brain is not going to function the way that it used to, is what they said. He's going to need a lot of assistance with regular, everyday things. He couldn't even swallow on his own. They had to send a speech therapist to teach him how to swallow. So after the seven days, they said, he's going to live. <laughs> and I said, hallelujah. <laughs> That's all I need. <laughs> and my mom said, oh, no, no, no. Alive is just the beginning. God has great plans for your son. We're going to pray. 
Okay, Mom. Well, let's get to praying. <laughs> now, let me tell you. The time that he was in the hospital, huh, it was a combination of fear, anxiety, sadness, and restoration, and miracles, and faith, and hope. It was a minute-to-minute, day-to-day thing. But let me tell you, he avoided three surgeries as a result of prayer. And the doctors can attest to that. He was having awful stomach pain, would cry for hours and hours and hours a day. They finally figured out that he had his colon for whatever reason, had collapsed and was like this. Nothing could get through. So they said, we have to do exploratory surgery in his stomach to rectify the situation, which could cause other lifelong issues with gastro. We asked for time to pray. The doctor said, all right, you got a couple days. Three days we prayed. I asked him to redo the testing to see if my son was better. He redid the testing. My son was 100% better. His colon was completely normal, no inflammation, no damage, nothing. The doctor said, I have no medical explanation for that. (laughs) And me and my mom said, that's God. And those x-rays, not x-rays, those, the testing, stomach testing that they did to double check that was done on his father's birthday so I feel like he was there with God praying right along with us his bones they weren't aligning properly they were going to have to do two more surgeries we asked for time to pray we prayed three days later redid the x-rays to humor me, as the doctor said. Everything was aligned. Everything. The doctor said, I have no explanation. And we said, we do. It was God. The doctor also said that his growth plate was 90% uh, in a, in I don't know what the word he used, but basically he said his right leg wouldn't grow anymore because the major growth plate was damaged 90%. Well, let me tell you something about a month later, they redid all of the x-rays and everything. There was 0% damage to his growth plate. My son has grown, I, I, I want to estimate, he's grown from six inches since then, his leg, six inches. He went from he will never grow again to six inches. My son is now back in the 60th percentile of kiddos his age <laughs> for height, which is where he used to be before the accident. It went down to 20% after the accident, back up to 60. All of these miracles, just amazing. And the medical doctors were flabbergasted. They said they'd never seen anything like it. And we were so, so, so grateful. But... Let me tell you, it wasn't all roses and sunshine. There was plenty of sadness, tons of anxiety on my part. (laughs) Um, It was just up and down, up and down, up and down. But there was no denying that through all of that up and down, that there was immense, immense, immense progress. I could go on and on with his progress, his ability to When he started talking, he didn't just say one word. He started talking in full sentences, just randomly, three weeks after the accident. 
He couldn't write his name, and then a week later he was writing sentences. He could read books that he used to read before the accident, when they were going to start him with, the car is blue. <laughs> now, at the end of it all, he ended up spending six weeks in the hospital, three weeks in short-term rehab. My little angel came home on Thanksgiving, the day before Thanksgiving. The day before Thanksgiving. That's what we kept praying for. The journey didn't end there. He had PT and speech and, you know, therapy to deal with the medical trauma that he went through, the trauma of losing his father, the trauma of not being who he used to be. But every time and through everything, God was there. It's been two years and my son misses his dad, but he talks about him with a smile on his face. He reminisces about the fun times that they had, talks about ways that they're similar amazing. His 14-month-old sister through all of this somehow was completely happy and normal. <laughs> she lost her mom and her brother, like, and she was okay. Mark, my partner, he worked endlessly taking care of Olivia, still going to work, still coming to visit Lucas. I mean, walking zombie, but somehow made it all work and was immensely supportive. Let me tell you something. With everything that we went through, what got us through, what gave us joy in all of it, was God's angels. The insane amount of people that reached out that wrote letters, that made cards, that started a GoFundMe, that contributed, that made food for Mark and whoever was caring for Olivia, that sent food to me. The police officers there, they brought him on the helipad, which I thought, oh, they probably do that for everybody. And the nurses were like, uh, no, they don't do that for anybody. <laughs> we're not even allowed up there half the time. Um, EMS visited him, brought him t-shirts with signatures. You know, Terrence's ex went to the crash site, which I can't imagine how hard that was for her. And she found Lucas's beloved iPad. Somehow it was not damaged. And it had all the pictures of him and his dad on there. And she found his favorite blanket, too. <laughs> You know, just endless. My church paid for daycare. A church up there came and visited and brought him books that he liked. I mean, just anything and everything you could think of. We were provided for. I didn't work for six months. I had to do per diem for the next six months. Like, our hospital bill. Our hospital bill was near a million dollars. And somehow, by the grace of God... It turned out to be zero, zero that we were at the hospital. There were bills from the private doctors and surgeons that did stuff for him, but nothing insane, you know. I mean, I don't even know how that's fathomable how that happened. <laughs> God, God, that's God. And God placed all of these people to send us. I mean, when Lucas would read those cards, and see those care packages, he would smile. He didn't really smile much when we were there, understandably. But those things would make him smile. His friends calling him for video chat, even though I know that it was hard for them to see him like that, even though to me he looked a hundred times better. They didn't see him when he first got there. Just immense, amazing people. God's love is all around us. 
He's waiting to help us, to heal us. All we have to do is ask. <laughs> we don't need to be perfect. Jesus leaves the 99 every time, right? You know, we just have to have faith that he can and will and still does amazing, amazing miracles. I hope that this testimony helps someone anyone who's struggling, struggling with their faith, struggling with their life situation. God is there. God is always there. Praise Him in the storm. You will feel His peace. Look for Him in those around you, and you will see Him. He is amazing. And I have the blessing of every single time that I start to get down or get worried or whatever the situation I have to just look at Lucas and then everything is okay because you can't deny that he is amazing